はい、ではあの時間になりましたので本日のシンポジウムを始めたいと思います、えー、本日はたくさんの方にお集まりいただきまして誠にありがとうございます、えー、私はあの九州大学附属図書館研究開発室およびえライブラリーサイエンス専攻を担当しております、えー、石川と申します、えー、本日あの司会とそれからモデレーターを務めあのパネルのモデレーターを務めさせていただきますのでどうぞよろしくお願いいたしますでではですね、あの早速でございますけれども、えー、と最初にですね、えー、と文学、えー、付属図書館の宮本館長より開会のご挨拶がございます、えー、あの付属図書館長をしております宮本でございますあの九州大学統合診療医学部ライブラリーサイエンス専攻付属図書館共同開催イベント大学における研究データサービスの開催になりましてご挨拶を申し上げます本日はお忙しい中、全国から多数の皆様がご参加していただきましたことを、心よく熱く心から御礼を申し上げます。オープンサイエンス潮流の中、大学においても研究データに関する支援が求められるようになりました。日本の大学ではこの研究データのライフサイクルにどのように関わっていくのか、どの部分に対する支援を行うのか、どの部局がどこまで関与するかといったことは、議論が始まったばかりでございますまた,またそのモデルというものもまだ確立しておりませんこの度はすでに図書館研究データサービス部門を持ち積極的に研究データサービスを行っていらっしゃいますイリノイ大学の図書館の方々に来ていただきましたこれは九州大学とイリノイ大学アーバナ・シャンペン校との戦略的パートナーシップの一環としてイノイ大学図書館長のコラボレーションとして実現したというものでございます。私もあの2016年3月に本日のコーディネーターをしていらっしゃいます。石田准教授とともに3人でイノイ大学の阿波山弁校の大学図書館をに参ってですね。このオーコンサイエンスの大学図書館における役割についての調査と言いますか？あを行ったところでございますその際にはいろいろなことを教えていただいたわけですけれども、えー、この度はあの井上大学の天野三千校の図書館の方同じように3名の方が来ていただきました、まあ、実はこれは私どもが招待したというよりはあそその井上大学図書館の方から自主的にですね、えー、私どもの方に来ていただいて交流を深めたいあるいはこのデータサービスに関する議論をしたいということで、自主的にというか主体的に参っていただきまして、大変ありがたいことだと思っております。この場をくれて感謝申し上げたいと思います。で、この本新聞事務を通じまして、研究データサービス等におけるサービスやサブジェクトライブラリアによる研究者への研究データ支援の実際を知ることで、日本の大学における研究データサービスの方向性についても、皆様も一緒に議論していきたいと。本日を考えております、まあ、半日という短い時間でございますが本日シンポジウムが日本の大学における研究データのサービスのあり方について考える良い機会になることを願っております簡単でございますがこれをもって私の挨拶を理解させていただきますありがとうございましたありがとうございましたではですね、えー、と早速あの本日ですがあの皆様のお手元にもプログラムがございますけれども、えー、と2つの講演それから1つの,あの簡単な、えー、とパネルディスカッションの前の紹介ということとあのその後にパネルという構成で参りたいと思いますではあの最初にですね、えー、とハイディさんの、えー、講演になりますけれども、えー、とタイトルは、えー「イリノイ大学図書館における研究データサービス」でございますえー、とハイディさんはあの、ハイディ博士はですね、えーとえー、イリノイ大学の図書館の中にありますリサーチデータサービス部門というところがあるんですけれども、えー、とそこの部門長をしておられます。で今日はあのその中の、えー、と実際の、えー、とリンクとどのようなことをやっているかというのを中心にあの説明をしていただきます。では、よろしくお願いします。Thank you. Yes. <笑> Thank you very much, Emi. And、uh, Kimishiwa.、Uh, my colleagues and I are,、uh, are sorry we don't speak more Japanese, 
but we thank our translator for helping us today, and we are grateful to your library's administration for inviting us here. It's a true honor for us. This is a beautiful new library. This is a beautiful room and very professional setup, so it's a wonderful for us to come. So I'm going to start with an outline of how I'll present today, just to give you an idea of the pace and the topics that we will cover. So we'll start with a very simple introduction of myself and my colleagues, and then we'll do some background and some context for how we established our program at the University of Illinois. And then we'll talk in some more detail about what our program actually does. And then lastly, we'll talk about how we collaborate with different people inside the library and external on our campus and even uh, outside of our campus as well. So starting with the easiest part, meeting uh, us. So this is a map of the United States. And you will find a pattern. We're all from a very similar place in the United States. He's from the state of Wisconsin. Bill, do you want to wave? And he'll talk in a little bit. And then we have Mary, who is from Darien, Illinois, which is outside of Chicago, a very large, large city then in Illinois. Hi. Mary. She'll also speak in the next presentation. And then finally, there's me. I'm Heidi, and I'm from the state of Iowa, where I grew up on a farm. So we all like the Midwest very much. Now, we've not traveled very far, and we all work at the University of Illinois in the state of Illinois. This is a very large public uh, state University, so we have over 40,000 students and over 2,000 faculty. Very large, large campus. Okay, so now we'll go into background and context for the Research Data Service Program at the University of Illinois. The way that I usually describe this is a, a triangle of influence between funders, publishers, and researchers. This is important because since there are many different uh, areas of influence, uh, just having a government influence is not enough. There's also influence from these other areas. And I'll show an example here. So in 2013, a government agency called the Office of Science and Technology Policy, is a, that's an organization that is advisory to the executive branch of our government. So this is the United States president. This office advises the United States president. So in 2013, they issued a policy, but the policy was, in, was directed at our federal funding agencies. For example, the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health. And in return, those federal funding agencies, they issue policies, and those policies are directed at various universities. So then at the universities, they now have a cascade of policies, and so those policies roll down to the researchers, who then are required to figure out what to do on their own. And this is really why our research data service was established at the University of Illinois, because the researchers needed help to figure out what to do with these new government policies. But why the library? Why is the library the place to have a research data service? There are many organizations on a university campus. Why the library? There are several different motivations from the library's perspective for why they would want to establish a research data service. And so this slide has an example that I'll walk through. The first is really about the vision of the library. And you can see here that your library has evolved a lot. You have this beautiful new room with a lot of different collaboration spaces. So there's a lot of interest in libraries to evolve as research evolves. So the libraries would like to broaden the scope of their historical uh, role in preserving the as expert stewards of scholarly works from researchers. And this second reason for vision is that increasingly research across a lot of domains, even the humanities, is more data intensive. Another motivation is really uh, the service ethic of libraries. We like to help people, and so we like to help our researchers, and we like to help them research, do their research more effectively. We also like to help them maximize the impact of their research, and Bill's going to talk more about that on Monday as well. And then a third reason is really to, is to stay relevant. So there's a lot of pressure on libraries to evolve as universities and university structures evolve as well. So here's a timeline of how we established our research data service. And the first thing you'll want to notice is it took many years. It's a long endeavor. Uh, in 2011, right about the time that NSF started issuing data management plans, our university uh, participated in uh, an effort to do an evaluation of our campus and our strengths and our weaknesses. When we participated in this program and did this evaluation, on our campus, we realized that data stewardship was something that we were lacking in. 
So we did a, a year-long uh, year of data stewardship on our campus where we did different presentations and seminars uh, and had conversations all across our campus to identify how we should um, uh, do better with data stewardship. From that, this group, and from those seminars, we realized that we needed a central service, the research data service, in order to address this problem. So the group put together a proposal for our central administration, our campus, to fund the research data service. And that happened a, a few years later, in 2012. So from there, our administration agreed, and uh, we were the research data service became part of our campus's strategic plan which is a very important mechanism on our university campus in order to um, get funding. So the library during this entire period of time had been doing work with data services. So when they decided to fund the research data service, it made the most sense to put it in the library. For example, the presentation that Bill and Mary are giving was work that started during this time. So a lot of activity had been happening. So with the funding and the home for the research data service being in the library, uh, hiring was initiated in 2014, and it took a few years for us to get hiring complete. So during that time, once we had staff, we uh, did a many different activities, including uh, establishing our data repository called the Illinois Data Bank. So my, my goal in showing you this timeline is to show you that it is an iterative process at Illinois, and it took many years. Um, but at every stage, there is progress. So what is it? So we, we, we got the funding for a program, but what is the program exactly? First, we received funding for four positions. The director, which is me, two data curators, and a developer, a programmer for our repository. But I mentioned before that our campus is very big, many, many thousands of researchers. So you can't even do it with four people. So we work with many other kind of voluntary, part-time people on our campus. And then we collaborate in the library with our colleagues, also with IT professionals, different uh, research administration offices, um, the security office, many, many places on campus. Okay. So that's who we are as people, but what do we do? So there are uh, these main areas. The first is to know things in terms of data policies and best practices and what kinds of resources are available to the researchers. We also consult directly with the researchers on their data management planning, and even more importantly, on implementing their data management plan. And then we teach workshops on data management planning, as well as documentation and data publishing. And then finally, we publish data, research data, from Illinois in uh, our repository called the Illinois Data Bank. So that's who we are and what we do. Now we'll go through some specific examples of what it looks like to do that work. Very good. So what does it mean to know things? So one of the things that we do is we stay up to date on new policies from our government agencies as well as publishers and our campus. So what this means is we are on different listservs, we follow different websites. Uh, whenever there is a new government policy, we read it right away to understand what it means for our campus. And another way is we stay up to date on what resources are available for our researchers on our campus. Our campus is so big that there are times when people aren't aware that there is, for example, supercomputing resources available to them. Or, for example, there could be resources that are established off campus as well. So maybe there's a new disciplinary repository for MRI imaging data or brain image data. So much of our work is just around finding out this information because our researchers are very busy and they don't have the time to dig up all of this new information. So another example of something that we do is we publish uh, a very short email newsletter called the Data, Data Nudge, and that comes out every month. Uh, and that's a voluntary uh, new, news or listserv that people sign up for, uh, and we have uh, over 400 people who have subscribed at this point, and we get a lot of very good feedback on the content. And you're welcome to view the uh, archive of those emails at this link. So here's a sort of a specific thing then. When we do these activities, we often have to collaborate with many different areas on our campus. 
So, for example, with our central IT unit. So, for example, we might have a data nudge on storage, or we might have a data nudge on ORCID identifiers. So we draft all the content for this data nudge, and then we have other people look it over to make sure it's consistent with the practices in the other areas on campus. So thank you to the translator who, translators who did so much translating for these slides. I won't, I won't read this whole thing for you, but this is an example of feedback that we've gotten from this newsletter, uh, which is very positive. You can read it. So another example of the areas that we work in then is consultations. So in this case, we sit down with researchers and we talk with them about their research project. Generally, it is at the beginning of the research project, but sometimes it is later. And I'll provide some more examples later as well. But some of the kinds of questions that we help the research answer, answer is including what data can or cannot be made accessible to other people outside of the research group. Another example is uh, help them determine what data can be reasonably preserved. This is particularly tricky because uh, not all data can be preserved. Maybe it's too large or there are other restrictions associated with it. So we help the researchers think about uh, the problem. We also help them identify what resources are available on campus. That's why we have to know about all the resources available on campus. For example, somebody may have, um, uh, have some fairly large data and maybe they don't realize, or sometimes they don't realize, that we have resources, uh, cloud resources available that can, is, is, is capable of handling the size of data that they have. And then the, other, the last is to help, uh, ad help them identify what resources are available elsewhere. So here is an example specifically then. So in this case, we had a researcher who was very interested in helping her lab. She had several graduate students who were working with her, and she was concerned that they might not be managing their data very well. So we sat down and we talked with her about the way her lab was structured and what kind of data she had, and we helped her implement a plan. And so here again is the example feedback that she gave us. And I do want to point out two words of practical and customized. So we work very hard to make sure that the advice we give and the consultation that we give can actually be used by the people in the, in the lab. Uh, the next is DMP reviews. So DMP stands for Data Management Plan. And Bill and Mary are going to talk much more about this uh, in their next presentation. But very briefly, it is a two-page document that researchers submit with a grant application. So I think similar to the situation in Japan, this was new for our researchers, and so they needed help. So here are some ways in which we helped. So the uh, librarians at the Granger Engineering Library developed a template, an online template for our researchers to use. We also did a synthesis of common mistakes that people were making when they were writing data management plans. So for example, uh, Sometimes the researchers would overpromise in their data management plan, and they would say that they will save many tens of terabytes of data forever, which is a, not a very good uh, promise. So we advise them to do more realistic <laughs> data management plans. Uh, we also have done uh, customizations for an online tool called uh, dmptool.org. So these are all the ways that researchers can help themselves. They don't have to interact, us, interact with us in the RDS at all in order to do, get this sort of information. But we also offer to review data management plans for them as well. For this, we have to promise to do it fast. They often don't think about the data management plan until late in the grant application process. So we promise to give them feedback within one or two days. So we have done a lot of marketing on our campus to communicate that the research data service exists and that we offer this review service. So the way it works in practice is we usually get an email from a researcher. We do not have a, a physical library or we do not have a physical office where people just drop in. So when they email us, we generally try to reach out to our uh, collaborators in the library and on campus and they can help us give us input as well. 
So for example, if a chemist wants us to review our data management plan, we would reach out to Mary and have her take a look at it as well and get, provide us domain-specific information. Okay. So we provide uh, suggested language, we provide edits, we provide uh, um, new language, but we do not write the plan for them. They would like us to write the plan <laughs> for them. But it's very important that it is their plan and it is something that they can implement. And the agencies expect it to be tailored to their project. So here is an example. We often will work with our um, central grants office because they are the ones who work on the submissions of the grants to the federal agencies. Uh, and as an example of feedback for a researcher that we have done reviews for, um, they commented that they've even had good feedback from the granting agency about the quality of their DMPs. The next service area is really about teaching and education and the workshops that we do. So we do two different kinds of workshops. We have a three-part series that we hold in the library. So this includes, the first session is just an introduction to data management. And the second is on really documentation and organization of the data. The third workshop in the series is on data publication. Since this is a fairly new practice for researchers, we focus on why publish data, what kind of data you would publish, and how you can publish the data. The other thing that we do is on-demand single sessions. And uh, we have one example, which is smart and simple data management. Usually we do these in departments, so they're not in the library, but we go out to different departments on campus. And those are generally between an hour and an hour and a half long, 60 to 90 minutes. This is actually our favorite way to do training and workshops, is to go into the departments. When we do the workshops in the library, we often get a very diverse mixture of participants which can be very hard to teach because they have very different perspectives and very different kinds of data. So when we do workshops that are in the departments, then it's usually a um, consistent type of researcher in a specific area. So we can tailor the workshop very specifically to their domain. And I'll give another example of this later as well. In this case, we collaborate mostly with the librarians on teaching these workshops. Although occasionally we also work uh, and do workshops at the request of IT units or uh, research institutes. And there's a, an example of feedback just showing that we are really the only organization on campus that provides this kind of instruction. So the last one for the service area that I'll talk about is data publication. And by data publication, we mean making the data publicly available for anybody else in the world to use. So this is data that we accept into a repository and we hold securely and steward it as the library. So the, what we did is we developed a repository for Illinois data. It's called the Illinois Data Bank. And it's a self-serve publishing platform. What that means is the researchers can go to that website, they upload the data, they describe the data, uh, and then they publish it. When we do this, one of the staff in the research data service reviews all of the data that is published into the Illinois Data Bank. So she reviews the files and the metadata and then communicates back with the researcher if any changes should be made. So what this does is it allows our campus to have a centralized, central resource that preserves and provides access to the Illinois data. So the way that it works within the library is our developer developed a custom web application that interacts with our digital preservation system. It took us about a year to develop the system and we describe it in a paper um, that it's freely available online if you wanted to look at it in more detail. So in this case, we again, we collaborate with many different units on campus. For example, we have uh, uh, collaborated with our supercomputing center and our central IT for the storage. We also worked uh, extensively with our legal counsel on policies, and we worked uh, with the librarians as well. So in this example of feedback, what was most helpful to the researcher is that the Illinois Data Bank was very flexible for them. In general, we always like to uh, help people by recommending a domain repository, but there is not a domain repository available for all data. 
One of the other things that is very helpful about the Illinois Data Bank as well is that we curate the data, so someone reviews all of the data. And that's uh, the focus of the last session tomorrow in the workshop is curating data and what does that mean. So the last session then, or last, last section of this presentation is on collaborations inside and outside the library. So when we work with our colleagues, since the Research Data Service is a new organization, we try to match what we do with the individual. So in some cases, we serve as the leader. We're the authority, and we know the most about the topic for data. So in this case, we're really teaching our colleagues about what we do and how they can help. And another role that we serve is as a coordinator. So in this case, we might have a colleague who really just needs to use us as a central point of access. So we are sort of a gateway to that information. And then the third example is we have examples uh, of colleagues who are very well versed in data themselves, and we support them. And I will give examples now of each of these. So in the first example I'll talk about is in the biosciences with our colleague Kelly. The second example is in natural resources with our colleague Susan. And then in our third example is in engineering with our colleague Christy. So in our first example is with our colleague Kelly, and it's on implementing a data management plan in a bioenergy project. So this was a very, very large grant. It was a $115 million grant from our Department of Energy. So very big deal. So the initial interaction was the, P, the principal investigator for the grant reached out to the RDS to ask for advice on the data management plan. Because this was an extra big uh, project, the data management plan was extra complicated. In fact, it was uh, 10 pages long, which is five times bigger than normal. So this is what the RDS does. We, reviews, we review data management plans, but we reached out to Kelly to see if she was interested in helping us. So Kelly has a lot of familiarity with the domain. She has a lot of, um, she has a degree in the biosciences, and she used to work as an industry scientist. So while we knew a lot about the data management plan, Kelly was able to provide some important context for us. And Kelly is a relatively new, bi new librarian, so this was a way for her to get to know the faculty in this area more. So the way that it worked was we involved Kelly, and she basically shadowed the RDS as we developed the data management plan. For example, she attended meetings, and she provided comments on the draft document. Once the grants, grant was funded, Kelly continued to work with us to provide uh, training and workshops for this group. Kelly was especially useful because she had uh, experience in patents, and that was a new thing for us in the RDS, is how to handle data when there is patent information involved. So we see this as a very synergistic relationship. So the RDS helped Kelly by coordinating this process and teaching her about the data management plans and making her relationship stronger with her unit. And then likewise, Kelly helped the RDS because she is an extra person to help us scale because we're a small unit. And then she provided us with patent and domain experience that we didn't have internal to the RDS. So it made our knowledge deeper as well. Okay, in the second example, I'm gonna talk about curating data for um, our scientific surveys. In the state of Illinois, we have um, organizations called surveys, which do things like water to monitor the weather, uh, monitor um, like water quality uh, and natural resources. And Susan is a librarian, has worked with the, these organizations for many years. Because of the kind of data that these organizations collect, weather data, uh, water data, um, uh, natural resource data, it's data that is very important for very long periods of time. Because Susan is the librarian with these research units, she's very familiar with the importance of the data for their research. So the relationship between Susan and the RDS has been to, she curates any data that comes from these research institutes. So the most recent example is a researcher deposited data into the Illinois Data Bank that had to do with how birds fly. So instead of somebody from the RDS reviewing that data when it gets published, Susan reviews that data and does all of the curation. So we provide the Illinois Data Bank the mechanism for the depositor to, re to, to deposit the data, and we have um, structures and workflows for doing that curation. 
So for example, when Susan was curating this data, she knew something that those of us who are in the RDS didn't know. So when you work with animals on our campus or in the United States, you have to have an animal protocol, which says that you're treating the animals appropriately. So Susan knew this, so she was able to ask the researcher to provide a protocol number showing that they had done the appropriate ethics when they were doing this research. So by, by providing that information, the researcher can show up front that they have done the research well, and it represents them as the researcher better. So that was an example of something that we didn't know within the RDS, but Susan knew. And so that's an example, too, of a good synergenic relationship. And another way that Susan has worked with us a lot is around her own unit's policies on data management. So because the data is so important to the unit, they had worked for several years in order to develop a, a, a whole set of guidelines for data stewardship. And because Susan had worked with the research data so much, research data service so much, she already knew about our policies and uh, everything that we were doing on behalf of the entire campus. So she was extra informed. So she was able to bring that information back to that individual unit, and that helps the policies be consistent across the entire university then. There are times when sometimes uh, the policies or the suggestions are controversial. So we help Susan by providing her um, with support and also uh, information to help make it less controversial in her unit. So in the end, uh, the RDS helps Susan inform uh, the unit's policies and practices through curation and uh, development of guidelines. And then Susan helps the RDS scale because again, we are too small of a unit and she has good relationships with her unit. And then as I mentioned, she is a constant source for us of domain specific knowledge. And then my last example for working internal to the library is with our colleague Kelly, or sorry, Christy, who works very closely with both Bill and Mary. And Christy is an example of someone who is very independent and knows a lot about uh, research data in the unit. Uh, Christy has done probably dozens of interviews with engineering faculty about their data management practices. And she reads a lot of the literature about data management policies that are specific to engineering either in journals or through the specific funding agencies. So in a lot of ways, Christy doesn't need our help. <laughs> but sometimes there are still some particularly tricky areas and Christy uses us as basically reinforcement or backup. So for example, if uh, a publisher has a very um, specific uh, fun, uh, data sharing requirement and it's difficult for the researcher to share that data, we can provide uh, um, some authority and some more input for Christy to share with those researchers. So, and we are also an extra set of people who are paying attention to policies, and so we communicate with each other as we see new things develop. And we also worked with Christy to develop um, an interview checklist that I think Bill and Mary will talk about. And then we also worked with her to develop templates for workshops where she can just add in uh, specific domain specific information. So mostly the RDS helps Christy by being a supporter and being backup. And Christy helps the RDS by scaling again and also providing the most relevant material to the researchers. Okay, and then I will give an example of a collaboration that has been beyond Illinois. I have mentioned that in the Illinois Data Bank we do a human curates every data set that we get into the Illinois Data Bank. This is a person who reviews the files, opens the files, reads the metadata, reads the documentation, and checks the overall quality of the data set. But similar to uh, some of the other things that I've said, a one person can't know everything about a, all of the domains. There's too many domains of science. So we have partnered with over 10 other organizations, or, or universities mostly, so some examples are the University of Minnesota, the University of Michigan, uh, Duke University, Cornell University. Um, so the goal of this data curation network is to share staff. We call this the human layer in data, or the repositories. 
And I'll talk a lot more tomorrow about curation and what we do in, cur in that curation. But the overarching goal of the data curation network is to function as if Illinois gets a data set and we don't have the right expertise, but say somebody at, uh, at Cornell does have the right expertise, we can send that data to them for them to curate it for us. So similarly, say there is somebody uh, at Minnesota and they don't have good experience in biochemistry, then they can send the data set to us at Illinois because we have good expertise in biochemistry. So the idea is that we can have more broad and deeper uh, curation expertise by using all of these different universities. This also does a few other things. It helps us standardize and normalize the curation practices across these universities. So that means all of these universities were curating data the same way, which is good for consistency and the quality of the curation. And the last benefit of this for us is professional development for our local curators. So for example, if nobody uh, at our university is very familiar with a given statistical software, they can learn from a curator at another university. This is a very new effort, but we're excited about it, and uh, it is working. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you.